Anin, bonjour. Joel Egoistan, Disney Cast. Um, welcome to another part in this series of the history of Turtle Island. Uh, I think we're going to call this one part three. So I uh, hope you've been following along. Hope you started part one and um, hope you're enjoying this lesson. Be rich. So now that the buffalo are gone, the tribes across North America are now becoming very weak. The power is shifting. Um, I talked about Europeans bringing the economy to North America, but what they also brought was their way of thinking. And it's the way of thinking that still remains here today. They have a very patriarchal, hierarchical way of thinking. This is our way of thinking. Holistic, circular. This is the way of thinking that came across the ocean with those European settlers. Um, patriarchal meaning men. Male Europeans are at the very top of this uh, pyramid. And everything else beneath them um, is just that. It is beneath them. It is a way of thinking um, that came to these lands, that, that hierarchical way of thinking. And it was really, um, still to this day, really hurts and devastates our planet. And holistic circular thinking, it's about those seven generations and connections and equality amongst all the races. In the hierarchy of thinking, it puts one above another in every way that you think. Not just about race and government and education. It's all, it's a way of thinking, that, that hierarchy. And that's what kind of came to these lands, was, was that way of thinking. <clears throat> um, one thing a lot of people don't know about is um, during the times of slavery, um, one of the way that British, French, those European governments and settlers justified the inhumane treatment of indigenous people and, um, and African people as well was to classify them in this structure. You had your civilized people, your semi-civilized people, and your savages. And during the time of this classification, they actually said that savages don't have a soul. And if you don't have a soul, you are less than human. And that allowed them to shed their guilt and do all the inhumane things that they did to us guilt-free because they didn't see us as even as humans. They saw us as less than humans. 99.9% .9 of all DNA on this planet is exactly the same. The small difference is the melanin that we have in our skin. But in order to justify the ravaging of all the resources on Mother Earth, they created that way of thinking. These indigenous people are soulless heathens, and therefore we can do whatever we want to them. So when those slave ships were coming over to North America to help to build what is now uh, Canada and America, um, those ships didn't go back empty. It's not a good business model. They came over full of slaves, and they went back full of slaves. Not black slaves, indigenous slaves. They didn't take the women, but they would load those boats up with First Nations men, and they would ship those men back for sale in the slave markets across the ocean. Um, I'm not going to get into too much of that, but it's just definitely notable when you're talking about uh, that way of thinking and the way that we were treated here in these lands. Now, another issue is um, population. You want to have this huge, beautiful land that we're going to call Canada one day. We need people here. We need people to work the lands. We need a population to defend the lands. You can't really be considered a nation unless you have a certain amount of people. And that's actually a big factor. If you want to be considered a nation, um, you have to meet certain criteria. Today, the, the United Nations sets out that criteria. And if you want to be considered a nation, um, I'm going to do my best here. My dad was the poli-sci guy. But you need a land base, absolutely. You need people, you need a number of people, right? You need a language, you need a culture, you need a governing system, and you need a socioeconomic base, right? If you have those six things, you can actually be considered a nation and be granted nation status. Um, and that's interesting as well, because when you think about um, North America today, do we meet those criteria as a Canadian country? Yeah, we've got land, obviously. Yeah, we've got people. Uh, we have a governing system. We have socioeconomic development. Do we have our own unique language that is from and of these lands, right? Here in Canada, the main languages spoke are English, 
which is not from here. It's from England, obviously. We have French. Again, that's not from here. That's from across the ocean. So when you talk about that nation status, we really don't meet all six of those criteria. The Ojibwe do, right? Many of these other nations do. We got our own language. We're from these lands. We got our people. But um, it's just an interesting side note there, the nation status. So now our people are very weak. This, uh, this power shift is in full effect. Our numbers have come down. European settler numbers have gone up. And uh, it all begins to shift during this time in the early 1800s, right across North America to the mid-1800s. So again, the people. The government's thinking, the, the, the settlers are thinking, okay, we don't want to kill everybody. We want them to work for our farmers. We want them to work in our lands. They want them to be, to be assimilated into the mainstream population. So in the first part of this presentation, uh, we were talking a lot about uh, genocide. That's where you completely wipe that nation off the face of the earth. And again, hundreds of nations uh, are gone forever. But now we're talking about something else. Now we're going to talk about assimilation. <clears throat> we don't want to kill them. We want them to be assimilated into our culture. We want them to speak English, or French, depending on where we are in the country. We want them to worship the God in the Bible that we worship, speak our language, dress like us, look like us, other obviously than the color of our skin. And there's ways to get that down as well. So the government shifts from genocide because now that the power shift has changed and they have us more under control, um, now they want to start to assimilate the indigenous peoples into the mainstream culture. So the reserve system is born. Um, in the United States, they call them reserves. The reserve. Uh, up here in Canada, um, it's reservation, right? The reservations. Pretty much the exact same system, reserves, reservations. Um, we're going to survey the lands. We're going to find lands that we're pretty sure we don't want anything from. And you are going to stay in that one little pocket of land. Um, so you can be easier, easy, more easily controlled. And again, now we're talking about nomadic lifestyle, right? For us, we moved with nature and seasons and herds, and we had all these different camps we'd just go to if everything wasn't great at one of the camps. That's nomadic lifestyle. Um, but now they got us stuck on reserves. Uh, our Inuit brothers in the north, too, um, they lived a similar lifestyle. They were very nomadic peoples, and they moved with the herds. And again, another kind of side note I want to throw in is in the 1950s, um, up here in the Arctic regions of Turtle Island, the government hated the fact that they couldn't just go up and find the Inuit people. They were never where they were last time and they couldn't locate them. So the government pulled the RCMP to go up into the north and slaughter all the sled dogs. Um, in the 1950s, 50,000 sled dogs were killed to stop the nomadic lifestyle of those Inuit people. Um, Inuits would come into the trading posts and the RCMP would be there and they would just shoot every one of the dogs to help to curb the nomadic lifestyles of those people up there as well. Um, and as time went on, these systems moved to the north as well. So. They create these reserves and reservations, and they got us on these lands. Um, now they got to watch us a little bit closer. They got to count us up. They got to have accountability. So they assign these guys called Indian agents to the reserve. Every reserve had one or two Indian agents, and they were basically representatives of the crown, right? Representatives of the of the government. And their job was again to keep track of everybody and know who was what, how many kids you had, where you were. If you wanted to leave the reserve, you had to check with this person. You had to have a signed permission form just to go slightly off of the reserve to do hunting on your traditional grounds, or maybe to go to the next community to visit a family member. You were under the thumb of this person. And again, it was usually a man, um, these Indian agents. And you can guarantee they were not, well, I don't, you can't guarantee it, but for the most part, I know they weren't good men, right? Their job was their, um, to suppress us and to keep us down. So run reserves uh, were being watched, for being counted, 
but we're not assimilating fast enough. On the reserve, we're still speaking our language. We're still practicing our culture. We're practicing our ceremony. We're growing our hair still. Um, we are still First Nations people. We're just now controlled as far as the territory that, and the nomadic lifestyle that we lived. So the next big system after the reserves were all kind of in place um, was the residential school system. Now, just in the last two weeks, um, proof has come to bear of things that I've known for 30 years. Um, some of the terrible atrocities that happened at these schools. Now, these settlers were smart. They had sociologists and psychologists really think about what is the best way to destroy the culture of a group of people. Because again, they didn't want to kill us. They wanted us to be a part of their culture, but they didn't want us to be like ourselves. They wanted us to be just like them. So as an adult, as a 43-year-old man, you could beat me, torture me, starve me, you know, throw me in jail, whatever you, you can do to me, but you can't have what I got in here. You know, with this knowledge inside of my head, it's mine, and you can't have it. I'll always have it here and in here. Uh, but if we take the children away when they're just five years old, maybe even younger, and we take them from their families for 10 years, the policy of these schools was age five to 15. Now, I've seen pictures in residential schools with high chairs in them. And as you know, you're not in a high chair at five years old. So we know that they took those children much younger than five years old, but that was the policy from the, from the governments. If we take these children far from their families, far from their grandparents, we isolate them from their communities. Um, I don't know how else to say it, but we brainwash them to hate themselves. And we teach them that this is the only way um, that might work. So these schools um, popped up all across North America. In Canada, there was uh, 146 that I'm aware of peppered across the northern parts of Turtle Island. Um, if we take these children and we put them in these schools, um, it should work. So, so the government paid for the buildings. It was a government-funded program. Um, but the church actually ran the schools. And I'm not going to get too much into, 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 into this um, as far as like, the church part of it goes. Um, but it's no surprise, it's no secret, the church ran these schools. So when you're trying to take someone's culture from them, spirituality is a big part of it, man. If you talk about the medicinal teachings and you look back at my other videos, we were hugely spiritual people, right? It, it was just as much as part of us as the physical world, the physical, the, the spiritual realm around us and the connection and communication through ceremony um, that we were constantly doing was involving that spirit world. So we were very spiritual to begin with. So it was important for them in the system that it be the church to run these schools because they had that aspect, they had that Bible, they had that book um, to hold that against us. <clears throat> so the, the, the object of the school was to make us hate ourselves so that we would not want to be First Nations anymore and we would gravitate towards that mainstream culture, um, religion, and society. Um, and, it, and it worked really well. I mean, again, I grew up knowing absolutely nothing about my culture. My father, my grandfather, maybe even my great-grandfather, all alcoholics who knew little to nothing of our language and our culture um, as a result of this system right here. Pretty much every First Nations person who is alive today, is like myself, is either the grandchild or the great-grandchild of a residential school survivor, or the child, right? Or the survivor itself, they're still here, they're still alive. And this system went on for hundreds of years. The first residential school in North America that I've studied in my research was in 1664, opened by Jesuit priests up here in northern Quebec. And the last one that I'm aware of that closed in North America was in the Northern Prairie Plains in 1996. I've even heard recently 1997 
I was 18. Right? This stuff isn't hundreds of years old. This stuff has happened in my lifetime, in many of your lifetimes watching this video. And it's not a story that was ever taught to us in these textbooks. That's why this history lesson is so important, so that people understand the how we got from here to here, the fill in the blanks part of it. So the residential schools were full blown, full effect. Um, what the government says is 150 years. So, you know what I mean, from 19, 1800 to 1950, somewhere in this, in this time span, residential schools are in full blown operation. We're taking every child that we can, and we are gonna brainwash them to hate themselves in these schools. And then when they get out of school, <clears throat> they won't want to be Indian, and they'll sell their rights as an Indian. Now we start to get into like a little bit about back to trees. I know I'm balancing around, but it's, it's all one big picture. You can't talk about residential schools without talking about trees. You can't talk about anything, because it's a big connected piece, this history that we're talking about. Um, so, so when the trees, were signed you know, during these times in here with the First Nations. We were still very powerful when the treaties were signed for, for the most part. And the agreement was still to share the resources of the land. And most of the treaties, it wasn't the government telling us what was going to happen. It was us telling the government. And many of those treaties we wrote, you cannot dig deeper than six feet in Mother Earth. Because we knew that intergenerational damage that would be done for the sake of our children. You could plow the crops and till the, the soil, but you could not dig further than six feet. Because even when we wrote these treaties and signed them, we were thinking about that relationship with our children in the future, and we still held a very strong power during the times that um, we signed these, these many treaties. And in those treaties, <clears throat> they talked about sharing the resources of the land. So together, as European settlers, Canadian government, whatever you want to call it, and as First Nations people of these lands, we will split the resources and share the resources of these lands. We're talking about lumber, we're talking about the fur trade, we're talking about the economic development from the resources of these lands. They were to be shared equally amongst these two different societies. Um, and, and treaties are legally binding agreements in international law. When you sign a treaty nation to nation agreement, Right? It's not a group of people and, and a nation. We were nations signing a treaty with another nation, and that is binding international law that goes through time. So as time went on and all the treaties um, began to be broken um, and just ignored, <clears throat> the, economic, um, the economic obligation to the First Nations people became a real issue. Remember, European way of thinking they don't want to share. <laughs> There's billions of trillions of lumber here. They don't want to split that with anybody. So um, a lot of these treaties were just broken and ignored over, over the course of time, which you can't do. I mean, they did, but now we're in court today um, having all these, these court cases because these are legally binding international agreements. We can talk about treaty. And as long as there is one Indian, one First Nations person on North America, then Her Majesty's government is obligated to honor those treaties. So the point of the residential schools was to eliminate the financial burden on Her Majesty's government by enfranchising every First Nations person. <clears throat> Enfranchisement's a really weird word because you think enfranchisement, like you're gonna get something, you're gonna get enfranchised, like it sounds good. What, enfranchise, uh, what franchisement means is it's taking your status away. When they put us in these reserves and they rounded us up and counted us up, they gave us all numbers. I have a, a status card, not in my pocket, but on me, and it has a registry number on that status card saying that I am a status North American First Nations person. An Indian is what they call us. Um, we don't like that word today, but um, it's, uh, that's still used very commonly in government circles uh, as far as describing the indigenous peoples of these lands. And as long as there's one Indian on these lands, again, the Canadian government is obligated to honor those treaties. So the whole purpose of this was to enfranchise every First Nations person. Um, and there's so many different ways, okay? So you spend 10, 15 years in residential school, and then when you go back to the reserve, you, you want to join church because you've been told you have to join the church. 
Um, but if you want to join a church in your First Nations, mm, Indians don't go to church, uh, we'll take your card if you want to go to church. You're no longer an Indian. If you want to pursue post-secondary education, uh, Indians don't do that, we'll take your card. In some places, dig this. If you were 21 years old and a First Nation status person uh, and you spoke English, they would take your card because uh, Indians don't do that, right? There are so many ways to take your, your cards. And you can actually sell the rights of your children, which uh, as I went through my learning journey in this history is what happened to me. Um, my grandfather and grandmother went to residential schools and they suffered through that time. And they did not want their children to suffer the same fate that they suffered. So my grandfather left Wikimakong with his children, sold my father and his siblings' rights to the government so that they were off of that list and were no longer First Nations, and the priests and nuns could not come and take those children away. Initially, residential school was sold to our people as something that was good for you. You know, we're going to civilize you, and we're going to teach you English. We're doing this for you. Um, so some parents may have signed up their, kill, their kids to do that you know, during the time frame when this was happening, um, but it didn't matter if they signed up their kids. This was government legislated policy every kid had to go to these schools. Um, so they would just come and they would take the children right off the side of the road. You know, your, your kids would be walking to school or, or walking home from somewhere playing with friends and a horse and buggy would pull up or a van would pull up and they would just grab those kids, RCMP, the Indian agent, the priest. Remember, the Indian agent knows where everyone is and who everyone is and whose kids they are. So even if they came for your kids and your kids weren't there, they'd throw you in jail for obstructing justice. Um, one of the few ways that our culture survived through this incredible time was that grandparents would take those little ones into the bush, into the trap lines, into the mountains, and hide them there for their whole lives. Um, one of my earliest mentors uh, was Peter Ochis. And uh, Peter Ochis was this incredible elder with just a fountain of knowledge, of traditional knowledge. And um, that was what happened to him. His grandparents took him when he was a very small child before they could take him to those schools. And they lived in the mountains until he was like 43. It wasn't until 1960, I want to say 1964 in Canada, where a, a court case was won in British Columbia that allowed sacred objects and ceremonies to be legal once more. Because ceremony, um, sacred objects, dancing, potluck, powwow. At one point, it was illegal for First Nations people to gather in groups larger than four. <laughs> Most families had 10, 12 kids. Like, it doesn't even make sense. But again, they were just trying to stem our, our gathering and sharing of traditional knowledge by, by gathering in groups. Um, so Peter, yeah, he hid in those mountains till he was legally allowed to come out of those mountains with the objects and ceremonies that he carried. And that man spent the rest of his life sharing that knowledge with, uh, with all the Anishinaabe people and First Nations people that would sit and listen to him. He's a beautiful man. Um, I really don't like to get too much into the details of what happened in these schools. I mean, again, recent events have showed mass graves. Um, the government paid for the school, but the lowest bidding denomination of church got to run it. So it wasn't all just one denomination that ran all of these schools. Um, the Catholic Church ran 70% of the schools in Canada, which means they bid the lowest 70% of the time uh, for the budget to run the school from the government. But other churches got to win those bids as well, obviously. There's another 30% of these 146 schools that were run by other denominations here in Canada. Um, but think about that. The lowest bidding church gets to run it. So, you never want the lowest bid, right? If you're getting contract bids, you get the lowest bid and the highest bid, and maybe you pick the middle or somewhere. So these guys were going to run these schools on the absolute lowest budget possible, which meant the worst food, the worst healthcare conditions, the worst sleeping conditions, the worst building. Um, you know, everything was as cheap as humanly possible that could, could run the school. Um, and that contributed to a lot of factors, including this recent event of 215 children being found in a mass grave. That was no secret to me. I, I've taught that in schools for, for decades. Um, it's just math. It's a math problem. 
uh, diseases were rampant during this time. Our people did not have natural immunities to many of these European diseases. So if tuberculosis got into a, a residential school, we're talking about a dorm jammed with 200 kids piled on top of each other. One of these kids gets sick and now the entire dormitory is wiped out at one time. And they're operating on a shoestring budget. You know how much it costs to have a proper burial for for somebody, not that they would probably do that anyway, but they didn't even have money to document it properly or dig individual holes. They would just dig a huge mass grave, dump all the bodies in that, in that grave and, and cover it up. Um, I have a feeling that that one find that we just discovered uh, in BC with those children, that, that's not going to be the last one now that we're doing some radar sweeps of these schools. Uh, that was more common than not um, because the conditions were so bad. Right, the food, they called it mush. It, it was like oatmeal, but it was twice as disgusting. I mean, I, I kind of like oatmeal, but you know what I mean? The, the survivors talk about how bad the food was. While the priests and nuns were eating steak and salad and you know, bacon and eggs, the kids had mush uh, two or three times a day. Maggot-filled, disgusting mush that would make you throw up half of the time. Yeah, um, I, I hear stories about orchards. They worked on orchards, it's, um, but they weren't allowed to have an apple. You know, they har harvested eggs with all the chickens, but they got one egg at Easter every single year. Um, they call it residential school, but that's a joke, man. Uh, it was like slave labor camps. It's my understanding that there was about an hour and a half of class per day, and that was mostly about hygiene and cooking and like basic, basic things, English and the Bible. Um, for the rest of the 16-hour day, they were in the orchards, they were in farmer's fields working in slave labor. Um, there wasn't a lot of actual school involved in this whole residential school process. Again, the point was to really make these children hate themselves so that they would sell their um, status to the government and be enfranchised and we keep picking off the list of uh, indigenous people until there are no more. Um, what I said there was a direct quote, you know to alleviate the financial burden on Her Majesty's government. That, that's the purpose of these schools, so there's no Indians left, and therefore the treaties don't need to be honored. And this went on again for hundreds and hundreds of years um, here in these lands. The abuses suffered in these schools, uh, I'm not gonna tell you everything I know. Uh, obviously there was physical, mental, sexual, emotional abuse um, I've heard pharmaceutical companies would come and test their medicines on the kids, like guinea pigs or lab rats. Um, <clears throat> electric chairs in many of the schools. I've heard testimony from residential school survivors about being put in the chairs and watching the, the priests and nuns laugh. Um, believe me when I tell you, I know so many terrible stories and I don't like to teach the worst of them. I need you to understand that these places were nightmares. They were not schools. Um, they were taught to make these, they were created to make these children hate themselves. Um, and that's what happened. We, we, if you watch my videos on, on the seven grandfather teachings, you know, in our traditional culture, we were taught to, to love and, and respect and you know, all these beautiful ways of thinking. In these schools, nobody hugged us. You know, nobody loved us. We weren't taught to be good men. We weren't taught to be good women. Um, we were taught to hate ourselves. And they worked beautifully. This system worked to perfection. And it didn't just stay here in Canada. This residential school system, other nations came to us. You know, the New Zealand government, the Australian government, they came up to Canada and spoke with the, the Canadian government. And they said, how did you deal with your Indian problem? and they told them about the system that they created to deal with their problem, and then that spread to New Zealand, it spread to Australia, it spread to Africa. Right now we're talking about apartheid. But it was born, it was born here, um, with this system right here, and this system down here as well. So it worked really well. Um, I think I'm gonna stop there for now. Um, I'm not sure how I'm going to cut this video up, but I know that was another long slice, but um, we have a little bit more to talk to because I want to get into um, today to get into where we are. So 
I don't know how I'm going to edit this or cut it up, but I'm going to pause one right there and take a little break. So, um, miigwetch for staying with me for this long. <laughs>